بسم الله والحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله اللهم علمنا ما ينفعنا وانفعنا بما علمتنا آمين. Today in the book حسن المسلم in this series of du'as and dhikr that we're doing, we're doing a very interesting du'a which is pertaining to going to the masjid. Du'a al-dhahab ila al-masjid. The du'a that one would say when they go to the masjid. Now going to the masjid is something which a believer wants to do regularly because the believer's heart naturally gravitates towards the masjid to a place that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala loves. And sadly, yeah, it's true that um, some masajid, they make it very difficult for us to gravitate towards them in the way that they deal with the people that want to attend the masjid, or it could be the case that they're far away from the sunnah, they have too much bidah with them. However, uh, regardless of that, the natural state of the believer is that they want to be as much as possible around the masjid, especially if a masjid has lots of activities whereby they're teaching the community and they have activities connected to the sunnah, activities whereby they're uh, doing community events, etc. So this is something which makes us uh, become attached to the masjid. The Prophet ﷺ, he said in the hadith in Bukhari, سَبْعَةٌ يُظِلُّهُمُ اللَّهُ فِي ذِلِّهِ يَوْمَ لَا ظِلْ إِلَّا ذِلِّهِ that there will be seven categories of believers that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala would shade them on the day of judgment when the sun is close and it's a, a cause of punishment to so many people. But these seven types of believers, seven categories of believers will be under a shade of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. When we say the shade of Allah, we don't mean it's Allah's literal shade whereby something is above Allah and that allows the shade to descend over Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's throne. No, of course not. Nothing is above Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Rather, it means that this is a shade that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has specifically created for this special group of believers. So seven types of people, seven groups of believers that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will create for them a special shade on the day of judgment to protect them from the harm of the sun being so close to the rest of the creation. One of these categories of people is as mentioned in the hadith رَجُلٌ قَلْبُهُ مُعَلَّقٌ فِي الْمَسَاجِدِ a person whose heart is attached to the masjids attached to the masajid right so this person every time they go to the masjid he or she goes to the masjid once they've left they can't wait to get back to the masjid they can't wait to experience that special worship again in the masjid they can't wait to spend some moments again worshipping Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the masjid their heart is attached to the masjid it's like a magnet drawing them back. They've left. However, they're thinking or they're looking forward to once again leaving everything that they're doing, if possible, and getting to the masjid so they can worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. In Sahil Muslim, the Prophet sallallahu mentions a hadith. He said, أَحَبُّ الْبِلَادِ إِلَى اللَّهِ مَسَاجِدُهَا وَأَبْغَضُ الْبِلَادِ إِلَى اللَّهِ أَسْوَاقُهَا The Prophet sallallahu said that the most beloved of places to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala on this earth are the masajid. And the most detested places to Allah جل, on this earth are the markets because in the markets people are occupied with worldly matters and they forget to remember Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and cheating etc takes place there. So the hadith clearly says that the masjids, the places where people go to single out Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in worship to establish his tawheed and to establish his worship that is something which is loved to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And men in particular they need to remember this next hadith that I'm going to quote and the women of the family, the mothers, the wives, they need to remind the men of the household to act upon this hadith if they are able to do so. And the hadith collected by Imam Ibn Majah, the Prophet وسلم, said, Man nida falam fala salata lahu illa min udrin. That whoever hears the call to prayer from the masjid, meaning that they are living in the vicinity where if there was no noise, from car honking and uh, you know other types of noise if it was a quiet night and they were able to hear the call to prayer if they're in that vicinity then they have to respond to the call to prayer otherwise there is no prayer valid for them unless there was a valid sharia excuse so the prophet says whoever hears the call to prayer from amongst the men this is and they do not respond to that call of prayer by going to the masjid to pray there then their salah, their prayer is not going to be valid unless they had a valid sharia excuse. Like for example, they were sick. That's a valid excuse for them not to have attended the masjid. So because the masajid, as we're coming to know, just by looking at these few ahadith that I mentioned, are so beloved to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and the acts of worship there 
uh, so beloved to Allah جل, and rewarded immensely, then the dua that we're going to take about going to the masjid is very pertinent and very relevant. So it's something that we should teach ourselves to say and to teach our uh, male children uh, especially and um, the males especially. However, the females are not losing out as we'll come to know in a few moments, inshallah. So anyway, dua al dhahab ila al-masjid, the dua that is said once the person is going to the masjid. And this dua, it has many narrations, uh, uh, different forms, some of them found in Bukhari, some of them found in Muslim, and some found in other books of hadith. The one that we're going to look at is as follows. The hadith, it says, Allah maj'al fi qalbi nura. Oh Allah, put in my heart a light. Wa fi lisani nura. And in my tongue, a light. Wa fi sam'i nura. And in my ears, a light. Wa fi basri nura. And in my sight, put a light. Wa min fawqi nura. And put above me light. Wa min tahti nura. And below me light. Wa an yamini nura. And on the right of me, light. Wa an shimali nura. And on the left of me, light. Wa min amami nura. And in front of me, light. Wa min khalfi nura. And from behind me, light. Waj'al fi nafsi nura. And put inside of me, light. Wa addim li nura. Wa addim li nura. And make uh, the, the amount of light that you give for me great. Waj'al li nura. And give me light. Waj'al li nura. Oh Allah, give me light. Allah ma'ati nura. Oh Allah, give me light. Waj'al fi asabi nura. Oh Allah, within my cells, within my body, place light. Wa fi lahmi nura. And in my flesh, place light wa fi dammi nura and in my blood pla place light wa fi sha'ri nura and in my hair place light wa fi bashri nura and in my skin place light allahumma ij'al li nura fi qabri oh allah give me light and illuminate for me my grave wa nuran fi i'dhami and give me light in my bones wa zidni nura wa zidni nura wa zidni nura oh allah increase me in light increase me in light increase me in light wa hab li nuran ala nur and increase me light upon light This hadith, the first statement, Allah mijal fi qalbi nura, oh Allah put in my heart light, place in my heart an illumination. A nur al iman fi qalbi washrah lil islami sadri. Oh Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, give me the light of faith, the light of belief in my heart, and make my chest, uh, make Islam easy to enter into my chest. Meaning, make it easy for me to live upon Islam. So, first and foremost, give me the light of iman in my heart and make Islam easy to enter upon me, easy for me to hold on to. So to have faith and to have Islam enter into our lives and to hold on to Islam is something that we should be concerned with. It's something that should be, uh, you know, make us understand how valuable the gift of faith is as we compare it to our life with the absence of faith. As we think about how beautiful life is with Islam, we should be so concerned not to lose it. We should be concerned all the time that how do I keep it? How do I increase in it? In fact, if I can't increase in it, how do I at least preserve it? This should be the concern of the believer daily. Ali Imran, in Ali Imran, the surah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Ya ayyuhal ladheena aminu attaqullaha haqqa tuqatihi wa la tamutunna illa wa antum muslimoon. O you who believe, Allah is addressing people who already believe. O you who believe, have faith of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, have taqwa of Allah azawajal, fear and consciousness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, haqqa tuqatihi, in the way that he deserves that you fear him and have consciousness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. وَلَا تُمُوتُنَّ إِلَّا وَأَنْتُمْ مُسْلِمُونَ And do not die except in the state of submission to Allah, in the set, except that you die as Muslims. So this verse is reminding us that we have to be aware, though we have iman, we have to be super careful and we have to be fully aware that we should die in a state of submission to Allah meaning that Islam can leave us and it happens to many people okay and in fact the next hadith with the Prophet ﷺ foretold the time that we're living in now he described it to us he said for example in the hadith in Sahih Muslim the Prophet ﷺ said Badiru bil a'mal fitanan ka al muslim that race and hasten to do good deeds before a time comes upon you when there will be tribulations for your faith, there will be trials and tests which will shake your faith and maybe lessen your faith, like the darkness of the night. It may be the case that a person gets up in the morning as a believer. However, by the time it's evening or nightfall, then this person has become a disbeliever. Faith has left this person. Or a person gets up in the morning or a person uh, reaches the evening 
as a believer. However, by the time they get up in the morning, they are a kafir, a disbeliever in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Yabi'u deenahu bi'aradin min dunya This person sells their faith for some measly gains of this world. So faith leaving a person is a reality. <laughs> faith leaving a person is a reality that can happen. And we have to seek Allah's protection from it. That's why we beg Allah in this dua to give us light in our hearts, to place it firmly, the light of Iman, the light of guidance, the light of Islam, firmly in our hearts. The Prophet said in the next part of the hadith, Wa fi nura, O Allah, place in my tongue light. Ay, bi qawli al haq wa dawam al dhikr wa adim al ghafla. O Allah, place upon my tongue the truth, that I always speak the truth and that I'm always following the truth and that my tongue is continually making remembrance of you Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and that with this light that you place in my tongue it saves me from being neglectful of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala so when the tongue this this um, this tool that we have and and some of the salaf they used to say something amazing they would say that this tongue is so dangerous that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has placed it between uh, behind two prisons behind the prison of the lips and behind the prison of the teeth because it's, if it's not used wisely and if it's not used correctly then it can harvest for the person a lot of sins and a lot of misguidance however when a person uses it in the correct way for speaking the truth and remembering Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala then this person has a huge amount of reward so when the tongue is moist with the remembrance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala then there is less space for the whisperings of shaitan to enter upon the psyche uh, to enter upon the soul the thoughts and the heart of a person because when your your tongue is busy in remembering Allah جل, whether that's in the things that you read whether that's in the way that you speak to people advising them to good and advising yourself to good whether that's in making the dhikr of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reading the Quran uh, in your salah all of these things they keep you busy and they keep you busy with the remembrance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala therefore the opposite is also true that the whisperings of shaitan will not enter into our souls because this life is but a battleground for our soul. What is going to keep our soul busy? What is going to occupy our soul? Is it going to be the remembrance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Or is it going to be the absence of the remembrance of Allah azza wa jal? If it's the absence of the remembrance of Allah azza wa jal, then surely then the misguidance of, it, of shaitan, of the devil, will occupy our soul and our mind. And that's something that we want to avoid. So when we say, wa fi lisani nura, Allah azza wa jal, put in my tongue the, the, the nur, the, the, the light of Iman and the light of faith, then this is what we intend by it. And then the Prophet ﷺ said, وَفِي سَمِعِ نُورًا And in my hearing put light, the light of guidance. أَيْ أَسْمَعْ مَا أَنْتَفِعُ بِهِ وَيَصِلُوا إِلَىٰ قَلْبِي O oh Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, I beg you that I always hear that which I benefit and that that which I hear of benefit actually enters into my heart. Because sometimes you can hear a thing, it's beneficial, you're there, you're listening to the lecture or you're there listening to the Quran in the masjid or wherever but it's not entering into your soul entering upon your heart impacting upon your heart because of the amount of sins that we have between us and the revelation of Allah Azawajal. the more we sin the harder it is for the the, the light and the guidance of Allah Azawajal to enter into our hearts so we ask Allah Azawajal to put uh, the light of guidance in our ears so that it enters directly to our soul and to our heart and sadly how many of us we allow junk, all types of junk and all types of all types of filth and nonsense to enter into our ears and from the worst of them being music and, and evil speech and then we complain about not having a good state of faith, not being able to experience the sweetness of faith. One of the main reasons is because we're always listening or we allow ourselves to listen to that which is despised to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The Prophet then said, Wa fi basari nura, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala put in my sight the light of faith and the light of guidance. So sight is from the most valuable, obviously, of gifts that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given us. It's the most valuable of gifts. Just imagine for a moment, if you were to close your eyes just for momentarily, you come to realize quickly how blessed you are to be able to see and not to live in perpetual darkness, not seeing the loved ones around you, not being able to see the beautiful creation of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, not being able to read the beautiful books that you read, etc etc so sight is a blessing from Allah Azawajal. however many people abuse this sight this blessing and they use it for other than the uh, worship of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala however true sight is not the sight of the eyes true sight is the sight of the heart and the soul 
wherein the soul and the heart reflects upon the revelation of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, reflects upon the creation of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala also, so that it increases them iman. So there are many that are able to see in the sense that they have sight, but they never see the guidance, they never see the signs of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because the heart is blind. So the true sight is the sight of the heart. It either allows you to see or the heart is blind wherein people cannot see. For example, in Surah Al-Hajj, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, فَإِنَّهَا لَا تَعْمَلْ أَبْصَارْ وَلَكِنْ تَعْمَلْ قُلُوبُ الَّتِي فِي الصُّدُورِ Certainly, Allah azza wa jal says, certainly it's not, the, it's not with your sight, it's not the sight that is blind, but rather it's the hearts of some people that is blind, that they cannot see uh, the revelation of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala or the guidance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So when we say, اجعل في بصري نورا أو الله put in my sight guidance and a light illuminate us with the guidance of Iman in our sight we're asking Allah Azza wa Jal to allow us to see clearly the revelation and to see those things which bring us closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and to be able to reflect upon them with a good reflection Allah Azza wa Jal reminds us that there will be people on the day of judgment in the midst of the so many horrors that are already there and such a fearful situation that there will be people in an extra state of fear. May Allah protect us from that. Why? Because they will be blind. They won't be able to see. And why will they be blind? Allah tells us in Surah Taha, وَمَنْ أَعْرَضَ عَنْ ذِكْرِ فَإِنَّ لَهُ مَعِيشَةً دَنْقَ وَنَحْشُرُهُ يَوْمَ الْقِيَامَةِ أَعْمَى Whoever turns away from my remembrance, Allah says in Surah Taha, that this person will be, have a life where they never find tranquility and relaxation. وَنَحْشُرُهُ يَوْمَ الْقِيَامَةِ a'ma and we're going to raise this person on the day of judgment blind the person will say to Allah qala rabbi lima hashartani a'ma wa qad kuntu basira the person will say Allah why did you raise me as blind but in the world I was able to see I had clear sight so Allah says qal kadhalika atatka ayatuna fanasitaha wa kadhalika alyawma tunsa because of the fact kadhalika our our um, signs they came to you the revelation came to you the ability to ponder upon Allah's creation came to you, but you turned away from Allah's remembrance. You forgot Allah's revel revelation. So likewise, today you will be raised as being blind. So we ask Allah Azawajal to give us light in our sight so that we can see clearly the revelation of Allah Azawajal. And when we see the creation, it causes us to reflect upon the magnificence and the beauty of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So then the dua continues and it mentions that oh Allah, give me, give me light above me give me light below me, give me light on the right of me, give me light on the left of me. So we're asking Allah to give us light from all of the directions. Why? Because shaitan's attack comes from all directions. In Surah Al-A'raf, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala quotes the shaitan and saying, min bayni wa min khalfihim. I'm going to come to them, attack them from in front of them and from behind them. Wa an wa an and from the right of them and from the left of them. وَلَا تَجِدُ أَكْثَرُهُمْ شَاكِرِينَ And you will not find them. The majority of them you will find them not to be from amongst those who are grateful. So shaitan's attack, attack of misguidance, it comes from all directions in, in, and in all places. However, the one that is begging Allah Azawajal for this light when they go to the masjid, then this person by Allah's permission will be protected from the attacks of shaitan and inshallah will be safe. Now, there's a very special hadith which gives further clarity to what we're talking about in this, in this dua, which is begging Allah Azawajal for guidance uh, of light, begging Allah Azawajal for the light of guidance uh, in every part of our body and in every direction that we walk. In the hadith in Bukhari, the Prophet Sallallahu said that Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala says, Man aada li waliyan faqad aadhantuhu bil harb. Whoever, whoever harms a close ally, ally of mine, meaning that whoever harms the one who is close to me in terms of their worship and belief, then I declare war upon that person. And Allah says, وَمَا تَقَرَّبَ إِلَيَّ عَبْدِ بِشَيْءٍ حَبَّ إِلَيَّ مِمَّا افْتَرَدْتُ عَلَيْهِ And my slave doesn't come closer to me with anything except that which I have made obligatory upon him or her. So the, the best way to come close to Allah Azawajal is to come close to Allah Subh'anaHu Wa Taala by fulfilling the obligatory deeds. And then the hadith continues, وَمَا يَزَالَ عَبْدِ يَتَّقَرَّبُ إِلَيَّ بِالنَّوَافِلْ حَتَّى أَحِبَّهُ And then my slave continues to come close to me after fulfilling the obligatory deeds by doing the optional deeds. And he continues to come close to me. حَتَّى أَحِبَّهُ Until I love that slave of mine. فَإِذَا أَحْبَبْتُهُ 
And then when I love this slave of mine who does the obligatory deeds and continues doing the optional deeds, then I become for this person the hearing by which the person hears. Meaning that everything that that person hears, it's only going to the pleasure of Allah because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala keeps this person upon guidance. And I become the sight by which that person sees. Meaning that whatever the person sees, it's only the pleasure of Allah The person won't be looking to that which displeases Allah And the hand, I will be the hand of this person uh, reaching out to whatever that person reaches out to be. Meaning that the person will never reach out to that which is haram. And I will be the legs or the feet by which this person will, walks. Meaning that only allowing this person to walk towards my pleasure. And if this person was to ask me a dua, I would give him. And if the person was to seek refuge in me from any harm, I would suffice, suffice this person from that harm. So this hadith is clearly telling us that the person that fulfills the obligatory deeds and then continues to do the optional deeds is a wali of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, is a close ally of Allah azawajal. And when the person reaches this stage, then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala ensures that for this uh, male or female believer, then that Allah azawajal always ensures that whatever that person is doing is only the pleasure of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That which they see, that which they hear, that which they touch, that which they walk to is only the pleasure of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So this person is truly blessed because they have the light of guidance in every single part of their body. They have the light of guidance in all directions around them. So this person lives a life which is truly blessed in the sense that they only see, they only hear, they only speak, they only touch that which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is pleased with. So this person in their life, they experience true pleasure and we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make us from them, to forgive us our sins, to overlook us our sins, to increase us in faith and guidance and to make us from the description that we've just given. Some of the Salaf, some of the righteous predecessors, they would say often as an expression of the beauty of the sweetness of the relationship that they experience between them and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. For example, Al-Imam Ibrahim ibn Adham, rahimahullah, this Imam, this great Imam, as mentioned in Hilyat al-Awliya, he would say, لو علم الملوك وأبناء الملوك ما نحن فيه من السرور والنعيم إذا لجال دون بسيوفهم لجال دون عليه بسيوف that had the kings of this world and the sons of the kings, meaning the princes, known the reality of what we are experiencing when we worship Allah subhanahu wa taala, the reality of the sweetness and the enjoyment that we experience when we worship Allah subhanahu wa taala. They would have drawn their swords to fight us for that. I mean, they would try to extract it from us with their swords. So it's just an expression the Imam is giving of that we are experiencing the most valuable thing that you can find in this world, which is this pleasure when we worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala completely and to the best of our abilities. There is a sweetness in the relationship that the believer has between them and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We ask Allah that He gives it to us. Ameen. So the hadith, the dua that we're taking carries on and he says, Wa fi qabri nura, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give me light and illuminate for me my grave because the grave is going to be a very dark, lonely place as we know. We should visit the graveyards to try to increase us in faith and to remind us of our eventual destination. The more you look at a person being buried into the grave and you remind yourself that this is going to be my destination, the more you remind yourself that it's imperative that we stay upon guidance and that we seek guidance as much as possible. So this person who begs Allah for um, light in their grave, then this person's grave inshallah will be illuminated with good deeds, meaning the reward of the good deeds and also an illumination as a gift from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and it won't be a place of darkness and evil due to the evil that they committed in this life. We ask Allah to illuminate our graves. Ameen. <coughs> Tayyib. The next dua that we want to take today, inshallah, is the du'a, the khul al-masjid, du'a pertaining to entering into the masjid. The hadith it mentions, يَبْدَأُ بِرِجْلِهِ yumna. When the person enters into the masjid, they enter the masjid with their right foot. And then they say, وَيَقُولَ أَعُوذُ بِاللَّهِ الْعَظِيمِ I seek refuge in Allah, the Mighty. بِوَجْهِهِ الْكَرِيمِ وَبِوَجْهِهِ الْكَرِيمِ And I seek refuge in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's noble face. وَسُلْطَانِهِ الْقَدِيمِ And in his complete authority which has always been there. من الشيطان الرجيم, from the shaytan. 
Bismillah, then the, you say Bismillah, wa salatu wa salam ala Rasulillah, peace and blessings upon the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Allahumma aghfir li dhunubi, oh Allah forgive me my sins, wa iftah li abu abu rahmatik, and open up for me the doors of your mercy. So this is the dua that is said when you go to the masjid, when you enter upon the masjid. The first thing the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam mentioned in the, in the hadith, yabda'u bi rijli yumna, that the person when they enter the masjid, they should enter the, with their right foot. The right is what is used for anything of benefit and in anything of virtue right so for example when you go to the masjid you use your right foot when you come out of the masjid because you're coming back to the world you use your left foot because the world has no value in the sight of Allah azawajal. when you go to the bathroom a place which is not clean you use your left foot instead of your right foot so the right whether it's the right hand or the right foot is using things of virtue and in fact, it's mentioned in the hadith in Bukhari from my mother Aisha radiallahu anha, the wife of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. She said, "Kala Nabi sallallahu alaihi wasallam yuhibuhu atayamunhu fi tanaulihi wa tarudlihi wa tuhurihi wa fi shanihi kullihi." That in Bukhari, the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam's wife Aisha, she said that the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam used to love, uh, used to love na'm using his right whether it be for putting on his shoes or whether it be for combing his hair or whether it be for purification, starting with the right or whether it be in any of his affairs, meaning any of the affairs, any of the things which had virtue and value. So the person, they enter into the masjid with their right foot. Then they say, A'udhu Billah. They say, A'udhu Billah. Ay alja'u ilayhi wa attahassan bihi. Meaning that I seek refuge in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. I run to Allah azawajal for refuge and I seek protection with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. A'udhu Billah al-Azim. You say al-Azim, one of Allah azawajal's names. So this is a description of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that Allah is Azim, the most mighty, the most great. Okay? Uh, there's nothing greater than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. La fi dhatihi, neither in Allah's being, wa la fi asma'ihi, nor in Allah's names and attributes, wa la fi sifatihi, wa la fi af'alihi, nor in Allah al, al, in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's actions. Imam al baghawi rahimullah, he said, al azim al kabir al la shay'a a'zamu minhu. That the Azim is the one that there is none greater or more mighty than him, subhanahu wa ta'ala. So you say, a'udhu billahi, a'udhu billahi al azim You're seeking refuge in Allah, the Azim. So this name is appropriate at this point when you seek refuge in Allah and you use the name al azim because nothing is mightier or greater than Allah, subhanahu wa ta'ala. And then you say, bi wajhihi, bi wajhihi al kareem with the face of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the most generous. So when we speak about the face of Allah, جل, we understand that this is an attribute of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And pertaining to the names and attributes of Allah, جل, we believe in them as they came in the Quran and the Sunnah. And we understand them through the dictates of the Arabic language. We do not deny them as many misguided groups in Islam have denied. Because what these groups did. They said that if we say that Allah has a face, we are likening Allah to his creation. And that's absolutely incorrect because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says clearly in the Quran, Laysa kamithlihi shay wa huwa sami'ul basir. There's nothing like Allah azawajal, nothing compared to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. However, he hears and he sees, as an example Allah gave. So whenever we imagine something to be like Allah azawajal, if we do even imagine, then Allah negates that reality, that there's nothing like Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So Allah does have attributes like a face. How is that face? We have absolutely no idea the reality of that face. But He does have a face. How it is in its perfection? Tafweed. Only Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows that. So the point here, bi wajhihil kareem, and you seek refuge in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's noble face. Okay? His noble face, which and the nobility here means uh, full of generosity, full of nobility, etc. The, the word al kareem. His face, which is Al Karim, noble and generous. Wa Sultan ni al Qadim. So all of this is the first part of the dua that you say before you enter into the masjid. A'udhu billahi al Adim. Bi wajhihi al Karim wa Sultanihi al Qadim. And we've come to the point now. Wa Sultanihi al Qadim, meaning that his authority, which has always been there, his supreme authority and control which has always been there from the beginning of time. Because this, uh, this characteristic of Allah uh, this sifa of Allah that he has uh, sultah, that he has the sultan, 
then it's been there from the beginning of creation because nothing was there before Allah جل, and nothing can overpower Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala من الشيطان and then you say من الشيطان from the shaytan all of this seeking refuge in Allah from what? from the shaytan <coughs> shaytan from the word الشطن from the word الشطن meaning البعد that which is removed far away أي بعد عن الخير it's removed far away from good so the shaytan he is removed far away from good من الشيطان الرجيم الرجيم meaning أي الطريد المبعد عن رحمة الله the one who is moved and, and caused to be far away from the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So one may ask, I'm entering into the masjid, I'm about to do a good deed. Why do I need to seek refuge in Allah from the, from the shaitan? Well, because when you want to do the good deeds, like reading the Quran or praying or seeking knowledge, you don't want shaitan to come and whisper to you and to steal from the act of worship that you're doing. You don't want him to come to you and to make you start to show off. For example, pray a longer prayer because you want people to think that you're a virtuous person, that you're a righteous person. Or read the Quran in a more beautiful voice in front of people because you want people to think that you can recite in an amazing way. So you don't want any of these things to happen from the shaitan. That's why you seek refuge in Allah from the shaitan when you do these righteous acts of worship. So after having sought refuge in Allah, the person says, Bismillah. Al-ba al-isti'ana. The ba in the Bismillah, this first ba, is the ba al-isti'ana, the ba of seeking aid from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And every action that the person does with Bismillah, the action itself is not mentioned. However, it's muqaddr. As we mentioned in the previous class, it's estimated. It's there, but it's, it's kind of estimated or assumed, right? And what does the person mean in this situation? Bismillah, adqul al-masjid, taliban minhu la'un wal-ikhlas wal-qubul. I'm Bismillah, I'm seeking Allah's aid, entering upon the masjid so that I can have Allah's aid and help in being sincere, having ikhlas and qabul and having acceptance in the deeds that I do. Okay, Bismillah to the ba, it means I seek aid in Allah Azawajal, al isti'ana. Was salatu was salam ala Rasulillah. And then you say, Was salatu was salam ala Rasulillah. May Allah have peace and blessings and safety upon Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Ay, usalli wa usallim hala dukhuli al masjid ala Rasulillah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. I say this when I enter upon the masjid because I know that this is from the times when it's highly recommended to send salah upon the Prophet sallallahu and this enters into the general verse which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says Ya ayyuhal ladhina amanu aw you who believe sallu alayhi wa sallimu taslima aw you who believe send peace and blessings upon the Prophet sallallahu and when you say was salatu was salam ala rasulillah as salatu ala rasulillah it means al thana'u alayhi fi mala'i al-a'la it means that you are praising you are asking Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to praise Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa in the highest ranks, meaning amongst the angels, okay? Like the great Imam Abu Ali, he said, Salatullahi thana'uhu alayhi in the malaika. That salah upon Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, when you say Allahumma salli ala Muhammad, you are begging Allah azawajal to give salah upon Muhammad, which is that you praise, that Allah azawajal will praise the virtues of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam amongst the angels and others who are with him in the highest of companionship and when the malaika make salah upon Muhammad they are making the, the malaika the angels are making dua for the protection of Allah, of the Prophet Muhammad from any harm one thing to mention here when you make salah upon Muhammad it comes back to you in so many virtuous ways uh, you get reward first and foremost number two you fulfill what the verse is saying oh you who believe send salah upon the prophet muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam and thirdly allah azawajal makes salah upon you allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sends upon you peace and blessings because the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam said man salla alayya salatan sallallahu alayhi biha ashra to whoever makes one salah upon me then allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sends 10 upon that person so when you say allahumma salla muhammad wa ala ali muhammad or any of the other variations of making salah upon the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, then Allah Subh'anaHu Wa Taala sends upon you 10 salawat from him. So the person after having said this says, Allahumma ghfil li dunubi, O oh Allah, forgive me my sins. And going to the masjid and partaking in the good deeds that are done in the masjid are from the best of ways to have one's sins forgiven. For example, in the hadith of Abu Hurair radiallahu anhu, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, الْمَلَائِكَةُ تُصَلِّي عَلَىٰ أَحَدِكُمْ مَا دَامَ فِي مُصَلَّهُ That the angels, they continue to pray upon you as long as you are in the prayer place where you had prayed. اللَّهُمَّ اغْفِلْ لَهُ مَا لَمْ يُحْدِثُ As long as you don't break your wudu. 
So you've prayed and then you remain in the place where you prayed and your wudu is not broken, then the angels, they continue to seek forgiveness from you, for you from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah maghfillahu wa Allah marhamu. Allah forgive this person and have mercy upon this person. لا يزال أحدكم في الصلاة ما دامت الصلاة تحبسه and one of you will continue to be in prayer as long as the person is in the masjid waiting for the next prayer to happen and many of the scholars they said that for example Shaykh Ibn Baz and Ibn Battal they said that from the easiest of ways to have your sins forgiven is that if you're in the masjid once you've prayed you stay in your prayer place making dhikr and then the angels are making uh, dua upon you that Allah forgive this person I will have mercy upon this person now Sisters may be thinking, hang about, brothers just be mentioning what the men will be doing in the masjid. And we know that it's difficult for sisters to go them to the masjid many a time. Now sisters will be amazed to know that in fact women get more reward if they pray at home rather than going to the masjid. Because we have the hadith in Abi Dawood narrated by the great Imam of hadith, Imam Abi Dawood, where the Prophet ﷺ said, لا تمنعوا إماء الله مساجد الله وبيوتهن خير لهن. Don't prevent the female worshippers, the female slaves of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala going to the masjid. Of course this has conditions uh, and their houses are better for them if they pray in their houses, right? Now what you need to think about and what you need to ponder on is that the Prophet sallallahu said this to his female companions at the time when they would have been praying with the Prophet sallallahu in the Prophet's masjid. So you can imagine the huge reward that they get for praying with the Prophet sallallahu in the masjid with the Prophet sallallahu However, he said that it's better for them to pray in their houses. So when you pray in your house, you get the huge rewards that the men get, though they have to make the effort to go out there. You don't have to make the effort. You can just sit at home and pray. However, there will be times when it's good for you to go to the masjid. If there is a visiting scholar or something of that nature, then it's good for you to go to the masjid and to benefit from. Um, if the conditions are fulfilled like you don't go out wearing perfume you don't go out wearing alluring type of clothing and and the way to the masjid and the way back to the masjid is safe so the person after saying this beginning dua okay the person after saying the beginning dua a'udhu billahi al-azim bi wajhi al-kareem wa sultanihi al-qadim min ash-shaytani rajim bismillah wa salatu wa salam ala rasulillah then the person says Allah miftah li abu wa rahmatik oh Allah open up for me the doors of your mercy open up for me the doors of your mercy and of course the masajid are a place where mercy is going to be gotten Sheikh Muhammad Mukhtar al-Shaqiti Hafid Allah may Allah preserve him in his explanation of Zad al-Mustaqni he said wa ma'na dhalik and the meaning of this anna hadha al-masjid mahal rahmah that this masjid that I'm entering upon is the place where I'm going to get mercy wa laysat rahmatan wahida and it's not just one mercy one type of mercy that is because when you say, Oh Allah, open up for me the doors of mercy, um, then know that the doors of mercy are many. Then you're getting mercy due to the knowledge that you're seeking, the different types of knowledge, and you're getting mercy due to the different types of actions that you're doing also in the masjid. So we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make us from those that try to learn these du'as even parts of them and try to implement them and that are given success uh, for implementing them and that can live according to their dictates I mean anything which was correct was from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and any mistakes and shortcomings were from myself and shaitan if you have any questions then feel free